welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, okay, so we are going to finish up chapter three. We almost finished chapter three. There were just a few things I wanted to finish talking about chi squareds again, uh, and just kind of the general idea of chi squareds uh, and um, introduce what's called the multi arm bandit algorithm, which is kind of a fun idea. Um, and also a little bit about um, effect size and sample size, not so much on power, uh, but just a little bit more to wrap up chapter three. And then remember, you've got your first test uh, on Thursday this week. So we're, we're not going to have a meeting on Thursday. So just remember, uh, no, no meeting uh, in class on Thursday, right? So, uh, so I'm not going to be here on Thursday. Uh, I mean, I can be if you want me to, but we're not going to do any material. Um, you can use that time to do test one if you want to, but test number one, uh, and maybe I'll keep it in red, test number one will be available all day, oops, combine the two words, all day on Thursday. Okay. And here are some details. Test number one, it's going to be chapters one through three. Okay. I'm going to make it 30 questions. Okay. And I, uh, it's going to basically be those three multiple choice assignments smushed into one. Okay. And, uh, but it's only going to be a timed 60 minute quiz. Okay, so a, a test quiz, whatever, they're the same. Um, and so it's going to be 30 questions. And those questions are going to be from the assignments. Okay. And it's going to be a 60 minute timed test. That means you only have two minutes per question, right? And so that's that's reading the question, reading all the options, and picking the right one. Okay, so you're not really going to have time to refer to uh, you, your notes or anything like that, right? So so you do have to know this stuff. Okay, and so two minutes per question. is not a lot of time, okay? So so keep your pace up, right? So you have to move kind of uh, relatively quickly through, through these questions. And that's because they are just multiple choice. And I, I don't wanna make it too easy. I think it's easy in the sense that, uh, you know, they're just from the assignments, right? So nothing, nothing crazy there. Um, but uh, you do have to, keep your pace up, okay? So uh, two minutes per question is, is not a lot of time. So, um, so you'll need to be prepared, right? So you'll still have to be prepared, but you, it's open book. You can have whatever resources you want, um, but just be aware, right? So uh, two minutes per question is not a lot of time. Uh, so uh, be sure to keep your pace up. Okay, I'll rewrite that. Okay, so that's your warning. It's going to feel long, right? Um, and but there's there's nothing crazy going on. Okay. It's just going to be, okay, how much do you actually know? All right. 
Uh, good. So you don't have to submit any work because it is all multiple choice. Uh, I might get you to submit work for for test two, depending on you know what I get you to do. Um, but I I think the grades are going to be really high for this test, so we'll see. Uh, but I'm okay with that. That's fine. Okay. Well, I guess we'll see. Okay. I uh, so. Uh, but we're not meeting on Thursday. It's a 60 minute time test and it'll be available uh, all day on Thursday. I say all day because I might make it, um, we'll see what's easiest. I'll make it open for 24 hours. So the full Thursday, so from you know midnight in the morning, let's call it until midnight at night, uh, but that's hard to, to articulate in writing here, so uh, I'll just say all day, okay? Uh, just the concepts. So uh, only the, the questions that have been labeled assignment. So there are no, no coding, no lab questions that you have to sort out, right? And so um, just concepts. Awesome. Because uh, the coding, I mean, I don't think that you should be tested on code uh, or on your coding because that's all about, you know, sitting down, working through it, Googling and taking your time and just kind of um, figuring stuff out. So no, no code on this, on this one. Okay. Uh, I did post kind of a, a different type of lab. I'm, I'm testing different things out. And uh, so I did generate that lab in R and then I'm able to import it into Moodle. Now that doesn't matter to you, but uh, the reason I mention it is because some of the answers are being marked wrong when they're correct. Okay, so uh, I don't know why that is. For example, when I submitted my test run, it marked the, the mean of group A as wrong, but then the difference between the means was correct. Uh, and that is just really weird. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, so if, if you feel like, okay, I did it well, I did it correctly, then you probably did. And, uh, and don't worry about it. I'll go through and adjust your grades um, afterwards. Okay, so if it's doing, if it's marking weird, uh, then you can get in touch with me if you're not sure. But um, but as a safety, let's update, uh, upload your work, right? So you can work in an RMD file where you can talk about what you're doing. You can include your R code chunks. Uh, it is assuming that you're using R. You're allowed to check it with Python if you want to, uh, but you you should find your answers using R because they might be slightly different. Um, okay, so uh, for the lab, for last week's lab, uh, some answers are being marked uh, incorrect when they are correct. For last week's lab, uh, some answers are marked wrong when they are not so i will adjust the grades after the due date which i think is this friday uh and it, it is just five questions that you have to answer right but you're going to use that r code from the textbook uh and we're just doing a portion of an example from the textbook uh, so uh, some answers are marked wrong when they are not, so I will uh, adjust your grades after the due date. Okay, and uh, so I want you to submit your work, work in an RMD file and submit your uh, PDF to the Dropbox so 
so I can check your work. Yeah. So if what you did looks reasonable, then I can give you those marks and I can adjust them after the fact. Okay. Uh, well, so it could be a rounding issue. It's, but for me, the tolerance was supposed to be to the fourth decimal place. And from what I was doing, I was putting all the decimal places that I was getting. So I don't know. Um, and I don't know what the issue is. I'm using this new package called R exams where I'm able to build these Moodle questions. Um, but I just, I don't know it well enough, I guess. So that's why I have to put in the work and make adjustments later. But in general, it's working pretty well. But just be aware that if it's marking it wrong, but then the other parts are good, then it's probably fine. Okay. Um, but yeah, likely a rounding issue. I just don't know where. <laughs> um, okay. So talked about test one. We talked about the lab. The lab for this week, I'll post something similar. Uh, but I want to get into chapter four, or depending on how far into chapter four, we might just do another um, kind of work through in chapter three. That's totally fine, too. I'm fine with it. Okay, so um, let's see here. A little bit of review. We're just going to wrap up chapter three and dig into chapter four, uh, but I can put it off till next week too, just so, because I always find it confusing when I cover material that isn't on the quiz or on the test before, anyways, we'll see. Okay, so a little bit of review. Uh, if we are analyzing counts, so count data, categorical data, then often we're gonna use a chi-squared test, okay? So to analyze count data, which is categorical data, we often use a, a chi-squared test. We often use a chi-squared test. Um, and usually we're going to, in data science, we're going to be testing independence. Is this group of consumers independent from this group of consumers, or does the fact that you are, uh, your, your customer is female, does that change how much they're going to spend, uh, or how many things they're going to buy, maybe, right, counts, um, right, that kind of thing. So now we're testing for this independence between the two groups or multiple groups across many groups. Uh, and so uh, in data science, we focus on chi-squared tests for independence. Right. Uh, are these uh, two groups independent of each other? Are these two groups, oops, clean that up. Independent of each other. We can actually look at uh, or uh, or more, right? Two or more groups independent of each other, and what that means is that we have some expected distribution, right? So this requires 
uh, an expected distribution. Now, if we just have multiple groups and we just want to know are they independent of each other, then we compare it to as if everyone was just evenly spread across the groups, right? Then the differences that I saw there between the observed and the expected, are they beyond what I would normally, uh, and I shouldn't say normally, what I would expect to see, right? And so um, let's see here. So are these two or more groups independent of each other? Uh, and we compare, compare the observed counts to expected counts. Okay. <clears throat> So the chi-squared statistic, right, is a calculation, and we're not going to calculate it by hand anymore, although the chi-squared isn't that bad to calculate by hand, depending on the size of your table. Um, but a chi-squared statistic, just to reiterate, is how, uh, how far from the expected count is my observed count? So a measure of the extent to which the observed data, to which the observed data uh, departs from expectation parts from expectation. Okay. Now this expectation is of course the null hypothesized distribution. So this is from the null hypothesis, which might be that the groups are even or the groups are independent of each other. Groups are independent. And depending on if we just have one categorical variable or one factor variable that we're dealing with, uh, or if we're looking at um, two variables at the same time, right, that, that's going to determine how we find our expected values, right? And so if we have one categorical variable, then I might have um, my count. Let's say uh, you have your grades. Let's say there's only A, B, C, and, and well, D, but is basically a fail. Uh, a, B, C, and F, right? Maybe, for example, grades. If these grades were independent of each other, right, then I would expect the counts to be evenly distributed, right? So independence would mean that they're evenly distributed across these categories. Now, what's more likely is that these, uh, these groups are not independent of each other, right? And so I might have a count of uh, 12 students who got an A, six students who got a B, and three students who got an, a C, and five students who got an F. I don't know, I'm just making that up. Then I can find my total at 12, oops, 12 plus six plus three plus five is 26. So now my expectation is a uniform distribution which means that I would expect 26 to be spread evenly across the four categories 
right? So 26 over four, 26 over four, 26 over four, 26 over four, right? And so I have 26 over four, which is six and a half. And I'm allowed to have um, decimal places for my expectation because that's just what I'm expecting, right? So it's not actually a count. And the total is still 26. Okay. So how the chi-squared works is it takes the, it, it looks at the observed count and the expected count. And I'm just gonna write observed count here. Um, and it looks at how, how different are these things, right? And so the other way that we could look at this table is if we have two categorical variables, for example, if we have grades and gender, then we might have something like this, right, where I have uh, male, let's, for simplicity's sake, we'll only consider male, female, although, I mean, there are other genders, A, B, C, F. But a lot of these questions are going to be uh, just simpler if we just consider two genders. Uh, so now I might have a distribution of counts across the different groups, okay? And so this is, so here I have some number of rows. Maybe I'll have, I'll do it on this side instead. So some number of rows is the R and some number of columns, oops is denoted by a C, so that makes this an R by C table. It's gonna come into play when you're looking at your degrees of freedom. And remember, we talked last day about degrees of freedom. It's the number of, of, uh, of things that are allowed to vary. I shouldn't say things, but the word is escaping me now. Uh, <laughs> the number of... Uh, yeah, I guess the values that are allowed to vary. It's not that far from things. It wasn't that far off, uh, right? And so I only mention this because uh, this is what we would use in finding our degrees of freedom for our chi-squared test. But software just does that for us, right? So I guess it's not terribly important. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so each of these cells would have some expected count, uh, as well as obviously an observed count. And in general, um, it depends on what you're testing, right? Are the males and females independent of each other? Usually that's what we care about, uh, right? Is being male independent of being female for putting you in the A category, right? Or are they dependent on your gender? Okay, so uh, one thing that I did, I screwed up here, is that we have to have at least five counts, five observed counts in each cell in order to use the chi-squared. So uh, this is gonna get weird, but what if I do, well, I can't change the total, I guess. Um, I'm gonna take from the 12. 12, I'll make it 10, which makes this five. Sneaky, kept the total the same though. Doesn't matter. Um, so one condition, we need at least five counts in each cell. to use the chi-squared test statistic. 
to use the chi-squared test statistic. Okay, so that's one of those conditions that we would have to check. Um, and um, I think R might give you a warning if there are cells that have a lower count than five. Five is not that difficult to get, right? It's just when I'm making up numbers, uh, I wasn't thinking properly. But anyways, so, so if we have five, at least five counts, then we can use a chi-squared test seems reasonable enough. We are going to have a different test if we have less than five counts, but let's deal with this one first because it's the most uh, common. So uh, a chi-squared calculates R, which is not the R that we, we've seen before the correlation. Uh, it's going to be the observed val or the observed count minus the expected count divided by the square root of the expected counts. Notice that this is not the R, uh, sorry, it's not the chi-squared. It's just a, a step towards chi-squared. So then our chi-squared test statistic is the sum from I equals one to R over the rows, or uh, also over the columns if you have more than one column, uh, or sorry, more than one row. Yeah. Um, from J equals one to C of R squared. Okay. So each cell is going to have some R, right? It's going to have some observed value minus the expected value over the square root of the expected value, which is the same as the in the numerator. And so each cell, we can calculate an R for each cell. What does this formula say? Well, for each cell, we're going to take R squared first, right? Uh, but then we're going to sum over all the columns and sum over all the rows, right? So we're just going to add them all up pretty much. Sum over the columns and sum over the rows. Keep it on the same page here. Tiny. Okay, but that's all it's saying. And of course, uh, R or Python is going to do this calculation for you, but it's good to know what it's doing. Okay, and then a, a chi-squared. So the larger the chi-squared is, what does that, what happens? Well, R squared, if we work backwards, right? R squared is just going to uh, get larger if R is large. So uh, if the observed minus the expectation is large, right? Then we get a large value of R, right? Whereas if these are relatively the same, right? The, um, the observed count minus the expected count is not that different then uh, I would get a small difference here, right? So R increases as the difference between the observed and the expectation increases, right? Because you're just dividing by the square root of the expectation. So then the chi-squared, a large chi-squared means that the difference between the observed and the expected counts is large. A large value of chi-squared means um, the difference between the observed counts and the expected counts is large. Um, oh yeah, so on, on test one, you're not going to have to do any coding. So it, 
you won't need R or Python, just your brain. Okay. So, uh, okay, so a large chi-squared value, and then we can compare that to a chi-squared distribution, uh, or we can resample and we can compare it to some, uh, some cutoff value, right? But we'll parking lot that. Awesome. Um, so just remember, a large chi-squared means that you have evidence against the null hypothesis, which is that these two things are independent or these groups are independent of each other. Okay. If we have less than five counts in any of the cells, then we use, uh, or we can use something called Fisher's exact test. Let me just Got like a tickle in my throat today, but not, hopefully not the COVID kind. I mean, I'm not going anywhere, but still. <laughs> it's a little, uh. anyways. Uh, so if we have less than, less than five counts in any of the cells, We should not use the chi-squared. We should not use the chi-squared test, right? Instead, we can use something called Fisher's exact test. So instead, we can use Fisher's exact test. Now, what it does is it considers all possible permutations, right? And then we're able to quantify uh, how extreme was that difference that we saw if we just uh, resampled all and looked at all the different permutations that we could have, right, with these with this data. Okay, and so uh, one thing that is a condition here, so if you have less than five counts, then you can use Fisher's exact test. However, all the counts have to be relatively small, right? So you can't have huge data and, and try to run all the different permutations. You could, but it would take a long time and, and be expensive, computationally expensive. And so you don't wanna do that. Um, so instead, we can use Fisher's exact test, and I'm actually going to remove that period and keep saying stuff here, uh, assuming or as long as, as uh, there are no, uh, no large counts, right, or no extremely large counts. Right, so an example would be if you have a data set of a million, then if you have a, a category with three counts in it and the remaining uh, million, right, or a million minus three, um, right, are spread out across the other categories, you don't wanna deal with that, right? Then, yeah, this this count of three is is not, useful to you, right? Because it's being overshadowed by the amount of data in the other categories. So then you don't wanna use Fisher's exact test. But for example, if you have 50 data points and one of the categories has three, then the remaining 47 are split across the other categories. You can work with that, right? You can look at, okay, how extreme is this that I'm seeing, uh, this distribution of counts, if I just look at all the different permutations, okay? And so that's Fisher's exact test. So it's got a couple of conditions. We use it if we have counts less than five. If you have counts more than five, chi-squared is, is good. Um, 
you could use Fisher's exact test, but you wouldn't because it's uh, more expensive, computationally expensive. So then you'd use chi-squared and it works just, just as well. Uh, and you want to make sure that you have no large counts, no huge counts. Okay. And so um, Fisher's exact test. Uh, considers all possible permutations considers all possible permutations to determine uh, exactly how extreme the observed result is. Uh, all possible permutations to consider exactly um, oh, I shouldn't say consider twice. Fisher's exact test considers all possible permutations to determine that's better to determine exactly how extreme uh, the observed counts or the the observed result is which is the observed distribution of counts observed distribution of counts Oops. okay So what it does is it puts everyone back into the pool and then you you pull everyone and you say, okay, you're going to be in group A, you're going to be in group B, you're going to be in group C, you're going to be in group D. And then it looks at all the different permutations and then we're able to say, okay, well, this one permutation uh, or something more extreme than this happened some percentage of the time, and that would be the equivalent of the p-value. Um, but uh, that's it for Fisher's exact test. And just considers all the different permutations, uh, but of course that's relying on the fact that you have a, a relatively small data set in general. Okay, so kind of a fun, uh, new, relatively new um, algorithm is the multi-arm bandit algorithm. You can tell, well, as soon as we say algorithm, it usually implies, uh, you know, we need computer computing power to do it, right? Because you don't want to run through an algorithm. You could run through an algorithm yourself, uh, but it's kind of with all this big data and, and this uh, cheap computing power that we've been able to develop some new uh, techniques. And so one of those is called the multi-arm bandit algorithm. Okay, so. Hey, did I say I ended the review? I didn't. The review ended. Let's say here, after we introduce those tables again. Can't remember exactly, but I. Uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah, chi squared. Uh, do you mean more than two, two variables? Yeah, you could, but you'd have to um, you'd have to consider the pairwise comparisons then. So chi squared, you can only have a table because it's really difficult to make a, a three layered table. Although I'm sure you could, but as soon as you're introducing four four layers or four variables, uh, I I can't visualize that. Right. So a, a 3D table you could make. With, a, with three variables, right? You'd have uh, one variable, two variables, and then another one here, 
make your counts go out. Uh, but 4D, too hard. You could probably. Computers can do it. Yeah, but the idea stays the same, right? So it actually, uh, yeah, the time dimension. Oh, oh thanks. Um, to me, it would just end up being the 3D one over time. But anyways, I, I don't actually know. And that's OK. <laughs> um, but, but you're right. You're absolutely right. This, uh, this observed minus the expectation over the square root of the expectation, you can apply it to any dimension um, of variables. OK. So uh, the multi-arm bandit. algorithm is uh, relatively new. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they kind of thought of it, but then it was too hard to implement by hand, of course. Uh, but the idea is you have multiple treatments that you want to assess, right? And so we can use it. Um, we can use it to assess multiple treatments right so for example it, it might be i uh, of course a web page design or maybe the wording of a headline what's going to be the catchiest uh maybe it's the design of a book cover or something like that right and so i uh, we have these different options and we want to pick the best one so we can use it to assess multiple treatments and um to help us pick the best one i'll put the best one in in quotes because uh, it might be subjective right but um so it, to help us pick the best one, okay, kind of weird, but uh, that's what we're doing. So uh, if we go back to uh, to the web pages, right? That's kind of the easiest thing to wrap our head around. Uh, is we've got these three different web page designs, and we're trying to choose which one should we be using all of the time. Now it assumes that they've already been built, or some version of them have already been built. Um, so now we're just trying to pick the best one. And uh, what happens is you can set your website to have some look and feel, right? And you can change that look and feel for each visitor. And that's how you're going to collect this data. And so there's a couple of different options for the multi arm bandit. Uh, and I always think of like some wild, wild west, like, da -da -da -da. um. Right, and so um, here we go. Okay, so um, we're going to be talking about wins. Okay, and so uh, how do I assess if a website is is working well? If I have a win, well, it might be if someone uh, clicks on a sale item or something like that. I don't know. Uh, it's usually measured in clicks, right? So if you click on the ad, right, maybe you're testing how should this ad look? And then if you have someone click on the ad, that would be a win, right? That's what you want. Uh, and then the one with the most wins would be the best one, okay? So how does it work? Well, one option, and there are others, but the main option is uh, we're going to have um, all of the treatments are shown equally but randomly each time, right? To get us to get the ball rolling, let's say we have three different uh, ads. I said web pages, but let's say ads because it's uh, really easy to think about. Okay, so uh, each treatment. which for example might be um, ad design 
So each treatment uh, is shown randomly and equally and equally. Uh, and we observe the wins, right, for each treatment. So each treatment is shown randomly and equally, and we observe or record the, the wins for each treatment. We observe or record, rather, um, the wins, which might be someone clicking on an ad, So we observe or record the wins, which might be how many clicks each ad gets. Uh, so the wins for each treatment. Okay. As we collect more data, right? So as we observe more and more wins and which, uh, which treatment is getting the most wins, then that might help me adjust how uh, how often that treatment is shown, right? So if an ad, if one of the ads, so one treatment is getting more clicks than the other ads, then I my algorithm would say, okay, well, I actually want to show that more than than an equal amount of time. I want to bump it uh, and and see more of that treatment more often. I'm still going to include these guys. Right, the kind of lesser treatments because it's possible that we haven't collected enough data, right? And so what might happen is the treatments might fluctuate like this uh, as we move through and collect more more wins. But at least the multi arm bandit is kind of like, oh yeah, you're the best one, you're the best treatment. I'm going to use you, but I'm also going to use these guys here. And oh, I'll go check on these guys. Oh, they're winning. Okay, great. So I'm going to use these ones now. And it just kind of uh, the algorithm adjusts itself as we collect more data, right? And that's really cool. But you can see how that would be computationally so expensive, right? And so uh, obviously it wasn't something that they were doing in traditional statistics. This is more for big data and, and data science specifically. Okay. And so uh, if, if a treatment, and maybe I should say one, oops, if one treatment, just so it's not so generic, uh, if one treatment starts to outperform the others, right, then it would be shown more uh, of the time. So if one treatment starts, oops, starts to outperform outperform the other treatment the other treatments right uh, it would be shown more of the time right so in by outperform I mean more clicks and maybe I should say for example, for example, more clicks, that would be outperforming, right? Or more wins. Uh, yep. Uh, if one treatment starts to outperform the other treatments, uh, it would be shown more often. It will be shown oops, more often. We continue to show the other treatments uh, in case the the uh, the winds adjust over time, right? So we can adjust over time. We continue to show the other treatments uh, 
so we can make adjustments over time. Right. You don't want to go for the very first one, the very first treatment that meets some threshold of being shown more often. You want to let the other ones play and, and see if maybe they start to outperform the other one. Then you would shift your, your priorities, right? Okay. So that's, that's one way that the multi-arm bandit can be set to run, right? There are other ways, but this let's just say that this is the main one, um, or this is the one that we will talk about. Okay. okay, so the last part of this chapter is on power, effect size, and sample size. I am not going to focus on power because uh, it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around and it's not worth the it's not worth our time. Uh, no, but the main, the main deal is uh, the effect size and the sample size. So how can we determine the sample size if we have some effect size in mind, right? And so, uh, and there are, you know, ways that we can calculate these things, but um, it's more of the idea that we need right now. So uh, the effect size, let's start there because we already know what the sample size is and we already know that, okay, there are ways that we could figure out what sample size I might need, right? And so this goes back to uh, one sample proportion type questions where we were able to figure out the sample size that we needed, right? Using a formula, right? And we had to say, okay, I want my margin of error to be this large. Now that is the effect size, right? And so, uh, in general, we just call it the effect size, and it's how large of a difference do I want to be able to detect with my test, okay? So the effect size is the minimum size of the effect you hope to be able to detect. Yeah. If you're trying to show that uh, the, um, I don't know, the average sales of two websites that you're comparing is, you know, there's a $30 difference, depending on the spread, that, that might not be that much. But let's assume that there's a big difference in these, uh, in these sales for the two groups. And that's how big of an effect size that you need to be able to detect or want to be able to detect. Well, you don't need a huge sample size to be able to pick up on that, right? If, that, if the actual difference is that large, then that's going to emerge very quickly, right? So for a large effect, uh, sorry, for large effect sizes, then we don't actually need a huge sample size to be able to detect it. Okay, and so, um, for example, uh, let's see if I can think of a better example. Uh, we want, we want uh, page A. page A and page B to have differences or uh, to differ in at least 20 clicks per day, right, in order for us to, um, to say that there's a difference. So we want page A and page B to differ by at least by at least 20 clicks per day to say that they are different, to say that they are significantly different, and I shouldn't, 
oh, I put quotes there, significantly different. Hmm. Did it again. Okay. Assuming the spread is, is uh, you know, assuming that this is a large difference. Right. So here, at least 20 clicks per day. Let's assume this is a large difference. Okay. We don't know. Maybe they're seeing 10,000 clicks a day, and then a difference of 20 clicks is not that much. Right, but it, in 20 clicks, so if, for example, page A has uh, 60 clicks and page B has 80 clicks, right, then 20 is a large difference, right? On the other hand, if we have 60,000 and 59,980 clicks, then that's not probably not that big of a difference. Notice that, of course, it depends on the spread, which I'm completely ignoring, right? But let's just, so the effect size, um, and we can calculate the effect size, but it's more of an idea that we need to wrap our heads around. Okay, so it's the size of the difference that I want to detect, right? And of course, that depends on the spread as well, right? Um, okay, what did I want to say here? Uh, so a large effect size, right? So if the difference is large that I want to be able to detect, then I don't need a huge sample size um, to make that happen. Okay. So for sample size, um, da -da 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 -da. Uh, for large effect sizes, that doesn't say large. For large effect sizes, right? Which is really saying to detect, to detect uh, large differences. Um, So for large effect sizes, we do not need a huge sample size to be able to do that, right? Because as we collect our samples, then those differences would start emerging immediately, right? Whereas if we're interested in very, very small differences, then I would need to collect a large sample in order to be able to detect that minute difference. Okay, so for large effect sizes, so to, de to detect large differences, we do not need large samples as the differences would start emerging uh, almost immediately. As large differences, would start to emerge almost immediately. Okay. Whereas for small sample sizes, we would require large, uh, sorry, I said sample sizes, effect sizes for large, oh my gosh, start over. For small effect sizes, I need large sample sizes. You know, you see how they, they're opposite. For, and maybe I'll follow it up here. For small effect sizes, um, 
uh, we require larger sample sizes. We require larger sample sizes. Okay. I'm trying to. So that's the end of chapter three that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and I, ah. Uh... We don't even have 20 minutes left, really. So I'm tempted to not start chapter four. We'll just push it to next week, if that is okay with everyone. Just because I find that it's confusing, right? If we start chapter four and then just constantly playing catch up, right? And so here, this is uh, test number one. up to here, All right? And that's the end of chapter three. Um, okay. How about this? Read chapter four for next week. A lot of it will be review. A lot will be review. From the beginning of the term, but also from stat 230. From the beginning of the term. And stat 230. Okay, so I think we should end there making the decision now. Uh, so we'll end there. And uh, let me just confirm the time here. Okay, yeah. Yes. I'm not ending like an hour early. It's just 15 minutes at this point. Uh, okay. So um, do the test. Read chapter four. I'll post another lab exercise for this week. Uh, for you to work through. And if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you next week. Weird. And good luck on the test.